Well, here we are again for another interview for World War II TV. I am with my friend Erin, who wrote this book, which is what we're going to be talking about. Links below and details of how to order it below. And um, welcome to World War II TV, Erin. Thank you for having me, Paul. Indeed. So tell us about yourself first and then about your book and then we'll go some freestyling conversation after that. Okay. So I was born in a one traffic light town in Texas. <laughs> it's no longer at that size, but... Two was... traffic lights now. No, no. It's, <laughs> it's actually now one of the fastest growing counties in the United States. So it's exploded in growth. But anyway, when I was there, it was a small town. And um, I grew up with a mother who always wanted me to travel. She taught French and Spanish in high school. And she really kind of pushed me out the door um, and said, go explore the world. And uh, I came to Belgium as an exchange student when I was, after a, a year out of high school, fell in love with the Belgian. And then went back to the University of Texas in Austin and started my studies and promptly got a job so that I could afford to come back to Europe on my breaks so that I could see my boyfriend. Nice. <laughs> so um, in the second year of school, there was a program called the Normandy Scholar Program um, at my university. And basically, uh, you, as a student, you studied World War II for a semester. And then they took us to Caen uh, for three weeks to uh, have classes at the Memorial Museum mm -hmm. and visit the battlefields and sites and meet people. And I thought, I really wanted to come back to Europe to live and work, and uh, I thought, you know, I need to know what happened in Europe, and I need to know this part of the history because it was such a major influential part of history for the world. And um, so I applied for the program, and of course, you know, was also excited that I was going to then have a free ticket back to Europe for the summer and I could see my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I started the program and um, I don't know, probably a month into the program, we were told to go do an oral history of a veteran. And this is, 19, this is 1993. So we're just approaching the 50th anniversary of um, the end of the war. And I went and I found this man, um, and I went to his house and sat with him, and he proceeded to tell me how he's, he, he, he basically, because of his Swiss background and because he spoke French, he was Texan, uh, when the army found out about that, they picked him up, sent him to northern Scotland, and as he said, taught him how to do everything with a knife except butter bread. Right, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they dropped him into Normandy a year before the invasion. And he lived with a French farmer posed as his nephew from the south of France to compensate for his accent. Oh, okay, yeah. And worked with the French resistance in preparing for the landings. He fell in love. Um, there's a theme here. Yeah, yeah. there's a theme here. Um, and, and as he's telling me what happens uh, in his story and how it unrolls, and, you know, He's crying and he's upset. And in the background, his wife of 40 years, who's from Texas, is banging on the dishes and getting really upset. Um, and then finally she comes out and she says, why does he have to talk about this? It's just, you know, it, it just makes him so sad. The war is over. We have to move on with our lives. And, and, you know, we just have to forget about this. And I just sat there. I didn't know what to say. And I... You know, in the end, all I could say was, you know, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that you shared your story with me, that you um, took the time for this, and I'm grateful, for, obviously, of course, for what he had done and how, how he had fought. And, 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 and all of this was still very fresh to him because basically what happened is when he got back to the United States after the war and he had left his French girlfriend, um, very difficult, with, with much difficulty, the American army said, you can't talk about what happened in the war for almost 50 years. So mm -hmm. it had just been a few years that he was able to start talking about what had happened. And so he was processing all of those memories. Um, and I walked out of his house and I got in my car and I just sat there and I just thought, oh my gosh, what, what is this? You know, history for me growing up was a list of 
dates and events and a test, dusty textbook. Yep, as, it as had, most people, yep. you know, it had no relevance on my life. And <clears throat> in this small town in Texas, I'm watching wars being fought in former Yugoslavia and other places around the world, and I'm thinking, none of that has anything to do with my life. And nothing that I would do can make any difference in those conflicts or in other people's lives. It, it, I just, it just never even occurred to me that I could. And so I was sitting there in my car after this interview, and I was like, wow. All of a sudden, history had become his story, you know, mm. and her story, and their story together. And, and I started to think, okay, he's in his mid-70s, I guess, by this time. And I'm thinking to myself, what are the stories that I want to be looking back on when I'm in my 70s and 80s? And so then how does that influence the choices I'm making today? And one of those big choices for me was, do I, you know, pursue this crazy, you know, relationship that I have with this Belgian who lives, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean, speaks a different language. It, it doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. You know, my family is here. And, and yet I, I just couldn't let go. And, and I started to think, I don't want to be, <clears throat> I don't want to be looking back in the end of my life and regretting choices that I'm making now. And not that I'm judging him for the regrets or the, you know, mm, the choices course, he made yeah. at all, because who could ever judge anything of somebody else's life? But um, it, it really, it really struck me. And so I started to look at as the program continued, and we continued to learn more and more about World War II, and 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 how World War II is um, <clears throat> represented, and how history is taught, and through media and film and <clears throat> um, uh, you know literature, I, I just became so fascinated with it and. So by the end of the program, I decided I would change my degree at the university. I was a French and geography major at the time. And there was a department in my university called the humanities department. And you could basically go to them and say, this is the topic that I want to study. And these are all the different classes I'm going to take that fill into that subject. And it was an honors program. So to do it, you had to then propose an original, uh, you had to do a thesis with original research. And so I said, look, I'm going to take all of these different classes and they're all going to basically look at World War II history and Europe through the, you know, I think it was, it was European studies from like 1850 to the present or something like that. But basically I was focused on World War II history. And um, my thesis was on the Battle of the Bulge and representation of the battle over 50 years and how that had evolved and changed. And so... I went on a, I would go to reunions. There's a, there's a veterans organization called the Veterans for the Battle of the Bulge, which is unique because it's not linked to one division. It's all of the divisions. It's anyone who fought in that battle. Um, and so I befriended the historian <laughs> of the organization and he started sending me all kinds of information. I ended up going to several of their reunions, a reenactment. I went on their 50th anniversary tour with them. Um, for 10 days through Belgium and Luxembourg and into northern France. And, um, you know, it was like two busfuls of 70, 80 year old veterans and some of their wives and me, the 20 year old mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> student. And it was fascinating. And I was fascinated by how, how, I mean, the, the stories and what they had gone through was very moving. But what I found over time, what fascinated me the most is how these men and women had dealt with their past experiences, how, those, how that past, how that history had influenced the rest of their lives and how they had lived with it over the many years since. And they all had different approaches. There were some that, you know, there was one veteran on that trip who, he just kept saying to me, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. I don't want to be here. I don't want to go to these places. I don't... I don't know why I'm here. I came, my wife passed away recently. I, you know, I'm lonely. So I came, I came on this trip, but I don't want to be here. I don't want to see these places. And another veteran was happy and jolly. And we went and we actually went um, one day and visited all of their uh, locations that they had been during the Battle of the Bulge. These three veterans, one didn't want to be there. The second one was, I was here and here. And, you know, he was talking and laughing with us and he was very at ease. And, 
and he was okay with it. And I, um, you know, when I asked his wife later, I said, you know, I'm so surprised at the way that he just, you know, um, he was so relaxed going back and visiting these places. And she said, well, he doesn't have any bad memories of the war. And I just thought, really? Wow. Okay. You know, and I, and I, and, and then there's another veteran who as well, and he had been back several times, but when we got into the town that he was in, he just went into this trance and we, there were about eight of us and he just took off down the street and was talking to whoever would stand close enough to him to listen. And he was like, I was here, there was a sniper there and we did this and then we walked into this building and then we did this and we walked out and for about 10 or 15 minutes, we were all kind of scrambling to keep up with him uh -huh. and follow what he was doing. And then once he stopped, he was like, he kind of came back to us. Yeah. And, and I've had those you know, and it's yeah. like, oh, okay. This is, and, and, and the contrast of the three was so, because you could see when he was, reliving this experience he was extremely emotional and and <clears throat> so those three experiences on that one afternoon really struck me as as yeah how do you how do you live with this past how do you deal with it you know and and then and then what are the decisions that you make mm. along the you know after the war and presumably the lady who said that her husband didn't have any bad memories he probably had had bad experiences but had either deliberately or subconsciously put aside those bad... You yeah. can't go through the war, I'm sorry, without some bad memories. Exactly. I mean, no matter, even if you're a postal clerk sending V-mails and exactly. you're in Ohio, you're still going to be death coming through. So in, I'm, I don't know the person, but I'm thinking that he had chosen to put, a, put away into some locked thing all the yeah. bad stuff and some of the good stuff. And yet the other person who was didn't want to be there had never managed to put that bad stuff away. And so they'd all been through the same experiences. And, and um, yeah. so, so bringing it to your book, you, you, yeah, well, no, no, that's good. That's great. That's how Obviously, I got it's about in all of this. Your, 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 your viewpoint is the, how can we take what that generation went through and use that in our own lives? Well, yeah. So kind to kind of, of to, yeah. to, to, to lead into how, how I got to that point. So, I finished my thesis, I graduated, I actually went on to get a master's in cultural anthropology instead of history because um, the, the president of my university who was also a historian and we had been in Normandy together for the 50th anniversary and he had read my thesis and you know, he said, I think you may not wanna be, you may not wanna get your PhD in history because it'll keep you in archives. I think what you like are the oral histories and the people. The people. And mm. so he said, you may look at you know, doing cultural anthropology. So I did. I ended up coming back to Belgium um, and got married to my Belgian boyfriend, who is now my husband. And I did a master's in cultural anthropology. And, and then I got pregnant and decided to put it all on a shelf. And one of my, one of my teachers actually had said at one point when I was, I was doing a summer program in women's studies and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my PhD thesis. And she said, well, why don't you just write a book? Why would you get a PhD? And I thought, oh. What a great idea. And I was like, oh, I'll just take that idea and I'll put it way up high on the shelf and I'll just leave it up there where no one could touch it, but not even me, right? Mm -hmm. So then I ended up getting pregnant and thought, yeah, no, I don't want to do this right now and the other issues in my university. So I stopped. No regrets. 20 years go by. I have got four kids. We continue to come to Normandy on vacation because I love, we love the beaches here. Um, we don't always go to World War II sites when we're on vacation, but it happens. And um, so, you know, 20 years go by and my eldest kind of climbs off a tank or a gun, you know, one morning and says, Mom, what happened here? You know, she was old enough to be conscious of what mm. was going on and wanted to know a little bit more about it. And I thought, oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, what am I what am I going to tell them about this moment in history? And. But more importantly, what difference is it going to make in their lives today? Why, why do they need to know this? And so the first question I had to turn and ask myself was, well, what difference did it make in my life? You know, I was in my early 20s when I spent these years with the, all of these veterans. And now, you know, <clears throat> 20 years later, as a mom, it's like, how did, how, you know, because I knew that those experiences and that time had had an impact on my life. Mm -hmm. I even went back and read my, my thesis to kind of see what I was saying. And um, 
but I had never consciously tried to put it into something concrete. And, you know, I would go to the beaches and, and come back to Normandy and I would tell other people, oh yeah, you want to go look at this, go see this. And they'd come back and they'd just be, they'd be so moved and so almost overwhelmed by the emotional response that they had to being physically on the beaches or seeing different sites. And, and, and I, I would hear this over and over again. And I, I almost, I wanted to start kind of going, yeah, and, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what do you do with that? What difference does it make on Monday morning when you go back to work or you're back in school that you saw this, you experienced these places, you learned about this history, but no one's giving you like really concrete tools of, of how to take that, that inspiration, that motivation, that gratitude and do something with it. And so that's where I started to say, okay, what did I concretely learn and how can I take that and, 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 and give it, give people, you know, specific questions or tools and ways to use, because <clears throat> for me, basically, and when I, when I, you know, we can, we can talk more about that, but I, I chose D-Day because I had to choose one thing to talk about. I couldn't talk about the entire war. I mean, you know, so I, okay, one event. D-Day, it's something that's very close to my heart. I have a very strong connection here. And, um, and as I started looking at it, I thought, you know, D-Day is such a great example because, it's facing this situation that seems impossible and making it happen. And we all have impossible situations in our lives. We all are faced with, you know, something that we're, we're going to, we need to do, but we don't know how we're going to be able to do it. Mm, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, I started to break that down and, and look at, okay, so what do you do? And, and what did they do? And, and how can you then take those different lessons and follow and apply them in your own life? And so that's where, that's where the book leads to, and that's where it comes from. And so for the, the viewers, this is <laughs> what the book does um, and what Erin does in your, your, the lectures as well. So it, when the, the planners of D-Day, uh, and we knew from the minute we came out of France in 1940 that we're going to have to go back, go back. at some point. <laughs> and, and the only way you can tackle that is by not looking at defeating Nazis, Nazis in one big go. But okay, let's start with the first bit. What do we need? We need, we need yeah. a basis to put people. We need the p troops to put there. We need boats for the troops. We need a plan. We, and you just build it and you take it step by step. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. anything else, you don't go and climb Everest on your first mountain <laughs> climb. You start with a hill just over there. Then yeah. you build up and then 10 years later, you're tackling Everest. And so, um, you know, we've had lots of conversations ourselves. And me being British of my generation, a lot of our uh, uh, learning about D-Day was really from people writing about the war after war to teach people how to fight wars better. Even yeah. Stephen Ambrose, uh, who is yeah. perhaps less well regarded now than he was, but he would tag along on the, on the, the staff rides from Stan Sandhurst and what have you back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And you had your Major Howard and, and um, Gen Hans von Luck and people on these things. But they were there teaching a new generation of soldiers how to fight, how to fight efficiently, which is not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying, you know, we, let's, let's have a war where we, we have less people killed and, and run it more efficiently. Mm -hmm. But it was not about how that war had affected the people in it. It was about how we can learn from that to, to fight wars yeah. better. So that I come from that background, as a lot of the viewers who are watching this, where mm -hmm. books come out of this, Efficiency and um, mm -hmm. and and so you're you're that. ignoring the the the, the, <laughs> the benefits of tactical advantages and weaponry and systems and just go okay let's look at them how we can well, learn from it yeah and also I mean, not just your book yeah you, you it's the engaging with people and lectures and meeting with school groups and mm -hmm. and you know we uh, for the, for the viewers benefit again we we met via our mutual friend Helen Patton the the, the general's granddaughter who is another American living in Europe and I'm a Brit living in Europe, and, and, and that places people like yourself and Helen's not unique, but they're Americans come to Normandy with generally an American view of the war. Brits come to the region with a British view of the war. And there aren't many people who live have a foot in, in, mm -hmm. in more than one camp. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. living in Brussels, as you do, that's you know, the, the, a real hub of Europe and German and Dutch and yeah. English and French influences there and Belgian husband and traveling in France and and like Helen puts you in this place where you've got a different set of eyes to look at things, yeah. which I think is beneficial yeah, you for know. your readers and the people you meet. Yeah, there's really... not many people like you who have got that 
perspective. Background. Well, you know, I had a lot of um, self doubt in the beginning when the idea, you know, you know, so so my children are asking me this question, you know, what happened here? And I'm kind of thinking, yeah, what did I learn? And then one day I kind of went back to all my history books on the shelf just to look at them because I hadn't looked at them for, you know, a good 10 years or 12 years since I had become a mom. And and then, you know, my idea of writing a book fell off the shelf and hit me on the head. And I was kind of like, oh, hmm, me? I, should I write a book about D-Day? And I was like, but who am I to write a book about D-Day? I didn't get my PhD. I'm not a Pulitzer Prize journalist. I'm not a veteran. So <clears throat> what story or what right do I have to write a book about D-Day? And um, around the same time, my mother gave me a book called Steal Like an Artist by an author called Aud Austin Cleon. And um, basically the premise of the book is all art is, all artists take from other artists. All writers inspire you, you to make something original. It, it's not that the idea is original, but it's the way that you take all the things that you love mm. and parts of and combine them into something that makes it unique and new because it comes from you. And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe I can do something that's different or come at this from a completely different angle than other people have because I'm not that tactical historian. There's enough of, enough of those people. We don't need any more. You know, and, yeah, and, I, and I, I have no desire to be. Not that I don't respect. It's, it's just that's not who I am mm. and, and, and never had been. And my, war, my interest in World War II was always something very different. And um, so when I started with the book, I thought, okay, yeah, maybe there's a way to combine this kind of inspiration and, and you know, it's almost like self-help and World War II history meet Indeed, together yeah. and personal development. But I found it so important because, yeah, I think it is. It's very moving. And um, a couple of weeks ago in Brussels at a, a conference, um, several authors and guides were speaking and they were talking about how well, people throughout time, travel to locations of battlefields and historical sites and to go see them, but it's also of the pilgrimage for themselves that they go on mm. to go to these sites and how they're working through something in their lives and, and the fact that they leave you know, their home and they're, they've taken themselves out of their daily routine. Um, they're somewhere new. They're, they, they open themselves up to something in a, in a way that you know, we don't when we're kind of going through our daily lives. And I realized that's who my audience is for this book. It's people who are, who, who, who are looking at, you know, they want to understand something about history. They're not going to learn everything about D-Day in my book. Far, far from it. It's there to inspire them, to give them some basic ideas, and then they can go from there and learn more um, about it. But it's, it's really to help people make sense of the, 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 the emotional and, and psychological effect that having to go back and, and, and if they're looking for, you know, um, a father or a grandfather or uncle or someone who fought during the war or, or maybe it's, you know, family members because, you know, you don't want to forget all of the French who lived here and lived through the D-Day invasions and the Battle of Normandy and how it influenced all of the local population, um, that's, that's so important um, to also realize that there's so many uh, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those survivors and those who didn't survive the war on that side that they also want to come back and understand and make sense of it. People come here for many different reasons, don't they? Yeah. So. Yeah, so yeah. it's 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 really looking at. I mean, I, my book really speaks to an audience who's who's a bit on that pilgrimage. So the people visiting Normandy for different reasons um, that we take that um, for granted, um, but it, that, we also mustn't forget that some people come because they're interested in the Mark II tank and the Mark III and the of Mark course IV, they are. and others have no interest in that. And you can be completely interested in World War Two and D Day without being a uh, a tank geek and mm -hmm. uh, nothing wrong with the tank geeks nothing wrong with those who aren't the tank geeks yeah. it's, it's, it's a it's, there's something for everyone to to explore and and at different ages yeah you know because 
a 15 year old or a 10 year old coming is not going to have the same perspective or interest that you know someone later in life I have all these little mantras on my tours is that uh, and it sounds awfully sexist this and we'll come on with sexism in the industry in a minute but <laughs> Uh, often you would have a couple where the guy was the war buff and mm -hmm. the lady was along for the ride and she probably had a choice in the vacation earlier and had chosen <laughs> her bit and this was this was Dave's day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, it happened quite a few times, the lady would say to me, actually addressed this at the beginning of the tour and say, just focus on him, this is for him, it's his day, um, I'm just here along for the ride, I don't have an interest in D-Day. And which I then correct the, her and I say that, that's not what you mean. I'm sorry. I said, what you mean is you're not interested in the different models of tanks. You don't have a war room with a John Wayne commemorative <laughs> rifle on the <laughs> shelf. But you are interested in D-Day because the very fact you're here in Europe is because, without sounding cliched and, and you know, they're here because these men liberated this country and we can now travel the world freely and marry who we want to marry and vote in elections and, and all that. And... Uh, mm -hmm. And then she'll say, oh, yes, that is, that is what I mean. And then you realise you've just put a spark of an idea in her head that being interested in D-Day doesn't make you a... You don't have to go down the geek path. You no. are interested in just freedom and, and, and happiness in a, in a sort of a, uh, way. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing I was going to address, which I'm very pleased about personally, is you are um, an interview subject who is female because we have <laughs> had this conversation many times over the however many hundreds of books mm -hmm. that are behind me, there's mm -hmm. about three by women. And it is changing. You know, I'm a big Twitter user and people are writing uh, uh, about history and a lot more women are writing now mm -hmm. and men are reading the books they write, which I think is as much as important as that. there's no point women writing books but only women writing them the men yeah. have to write, read them yeah. and it's beginning to change but it's a slow process and we're very lucky that within guiding in Normandy it's about half and half male and, and mm -hmm. female which is, which is really good however the driving forces still for the writing of books the presenting of new information the making of documentaries these are still mostly men although there are more female directors of museums now. Seven yes. Mary Glees, there's the Magali there, and, uh, and Juno Utah, Beach. Juno. So that's mm -hmm. changing. Mm -hmm. But still, for some reason, the writing about it is yeah. a preserve of men. Now, well, it was something... why, why is that? Why do you think it is oh. that? Why is it, is it... I, 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 yeah. Is it war films? <laughs> is, it, is it just, you know, <laughs> men watch the Dirty Dozen, women watch... I think that you can apply Fred that to Sally. a lot of different areas in life and... and, and in the world and not just World War II history. Um, the role of women and the position and the, the numbers of women who, and that's changing in oh. some countries and others it's not. Um, all I can do is speak for myself. It was definitely something that for most of my life I, I, I couldn't really understand or come to terms with. You know, I didn't, I, I could never explain why I was so interested in World War II history. And, um, you know, even as a student, in college and, and me changing my degree, I was like, I'm going to get a good degree in World War II history. People would be like, okay. And, and, then I, and I didn't, you know, neither one of my grandfathers fought in the war. They were both in Texas. One was in the Coast Guard. One was um, working in one of the uh, shipbuilding factories. And, and I didn't really, I, I had a neighbor um, who was a colonel in World War II in Italy. And, but I didn't really know him or relate to him as that. He was also uh, a Rotarian, and he was the one who was encouraging us to, my sister and I, to go travel, to go on exchange programs, to learn other languages and meet other people. And so he had that influence in my life. And of course, he always wanted us to call him Colonel Snell instead of Mr. Snell. Yeah. And I, I, you know, but otherwise, I didn't really have, I didn't grow up in a military family at all. I, I really had no connection. It wasn't like a logical step for me to say, oh, I'm going to study World War II history. And, um, and so when I had this idea to write this book, I thought, again, he was like, who am I to do that? And I'm, I'm a mom and, you know, I'm a woman. And, and what, what would it be? What, what would, how would, if I'm going to take the time to write a book and we're going to take the trees to print it <laughs> on paper, you know, what difference is it going to make and what does it have that, what can it offer to 
the world that merits that it should be printed. Something something new. I mean, Some, that, yeah, it has the, to be a different this angle. This year, with the 75th anniversary of D-Day, there must be publishers that we must do a book on D-Day. What hasn't been said before? I mean, yeah. it's all been said yeah. before. You can say it better from a different point of view, but to find something new is is, is increasingly challenging. But, yeah. But the, for some reason, the branch of, of which direction the men and the women go within the industry is is still happening. It, at the, in in it Britain, does. about equal numbers are doing history degrees, but when they then go on, it does seem that men go off into the war studies and the, mm -hmm. and the women, it, it's a cliche, but they go off into writing about suffragettes and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. social history. And, and, mm -hmm. and there are some very good books about last couple of years about World War II written by female authors, but they're still female subjects. There's one about um, fe a German test pilots written by a lady about ladies, and there's, uh -huh. you know, get the ones about the SOE operatives and mm -hmm. Violet Zabo, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. written by... Well, because... But, there's no, but there is yet no book about the landings written by a woman just with, with her sex being irrelevant to the subject. It's still at the moment... Yeah. They're well, writing, but your book, I suppose, really, it could have been a guy who wrote it. There's nothing particularly... Oh, I don't agree with that. No, maybe, no? <laughs> I don't agree. Um, no, because... I mean, obviously, you being, being a mum has an, an impact. In yeah, it, but, yeah. But, and, and, and how do I say that? I think, so, the book is all visual, if I can... Show people. Yep, sure. it's, it's, and we can put some stills up. It's yep. pictures. The whole thing, every page is, you know, a picture of some kind or other. And you have questions to the reader, and then and you also have the the readings and, and the, the lessons. And there are a lot of layers to the book. There's so you can you can take it on a lot of different levels depending on what you're looking at. But this, for example, um, this picture of, you know, we're talking about doing the impossible. And this picture of the Ameri these women pilots yeah. mm -hmm. positioned next to the U.S. military West Point cadet Maxime of risk more than others think is safe, you know, care more than others think is wise, dream more than others think is practical and expect more than others think is possible. The fact that these two things are put together for me is very, well, I don't know. I don't know if a man would think to do this. Okay. Yeah. No, because at the time women were not that. in, yeah, they weren't conceded. in West Point yeah. at the time. No. Right. And they didn't get the recognition even, you know, 50, 60 years after the war of what they've done. It's, it's Indeed, very late too. coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do go to West Point now. <laughs> and yes, so yeah. throughout the book, there's a lot of these juxtapositions of quotes, sayings, and pictures that combine together to make another statement. Okay, yeah, no, okay, point conceded. No, and that's... so, and then, you know, I also talk about, as a mom, you know, this picture of me um, on Utah Beach. Where is it? Um, it's, it's, I'm standing next to the, the marker the zero kilometer marker and talking about, you know, you have to, I'm not going to find it now, of course. Well, I can never find things, <laughs> own, but that's the... There. Oh, yeah. This yeah. picture of me standing at the marker and I'm talking about how you have to start where you are with what you have. This is a moment when I was really, you know, I was like, I, I've never written a book before. How am I going to do this? Um, I, you know, what are, what, are the, what are the first steps that I can do and what do I know and what do I want to share and what do I want to experience? And so I was on this tour and my, my like 18 month old daughter comes crawling into this picture that I had asked. <laughs> and I saw it afterwards and I thought, oh my gosh, she's just ruined the picture. And then I was like, no, actually she didn't ruin the picture. I am a mom writing this book with four kids and I have to respect both of those roles and I have to embrace them both. I can't hide. I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not this tactical historian. I'm not going to write yeah, that Yeah, you're book. not the former colonel with it. Yeah, so I cannot go out and work, you know, 50 or 60 hours a week on this book because I have four kids, some that are at home full time with me. And so how do I do that? And, and throughout the process of writing the book, I had to always kind of stop and allow 
both of those sides of my life to, to take place. And it was only when I incorporated that into the book that I felt whole, that I felt like I was bringing something true, true to me, true to what I could say. And I wasn't trying to speak for anyone else, you know, and I thought this book is perfect. This picture of her climbing into the picture, I was like, it's, it's perfect in its imperfection. Mm. And, and that's something that, yeah, I haven't seen that in a lot of other books. And is that a male or a female thing? I, I don't think so. I don't think it's that no. easy. And, but, and are you getting um, feedback uh, about who is buying your book? Have you, have you had some nice emails, I think, from people who've read it? And, 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 and is there a particular demographic? Is it the people you, you expected to be reading it, reading it? Or are there some surprises? Have you had like a West Point colonel saying, I think it's very good yet? Or is it, <laughs> is it the kind of people like yourself who are mums who are coming back to you? Or is it, is no. it as you expected or different? No. Or a I, bit I, of both? Actually, I honestly didn't know what to expect. Because I, I, I had so much trouble. Yeah, just, you know, people are always, t- they're always talking about, you know, who's your ideal customer? Who is your audience? Who are you writing to? And, and I had a really hard time clarifying that. And it was really only two weeks ago that, that when, when I was at this talk and they're talking about pilgrimages and, and traveling, I thought, that's who this is. Which and is interesting that you came up with the idea of who the book is for after well after you'd actually read it sure. and published it and been well, selling it. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that, you know, a lot of artists, you and writers, you, you create something because you have to create it. And you don't necessarily have the, the distance to understand or analyze or, or yeah, what, what it is that you've created until you can kind of step back from it or see other people react I think to it. any book, it should be... You should be really writing for yourself first. Yes, exactly. It, 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 and uh, exactly. And, and if I, anyone else likes it as well, that's a bonus in some ways. But it, yeah, like, uh, people who make music and make, make the music you like. Don't make the music they want you to hear. Make what you want to exactly. make. Exactly. So, uh, I think that, exactly. that applies. But I mean, for me, it was I wanted to answer the question to my daughter, "What's this all about?" And I wanted to answer the question for myself, "Is like, why after so many years, every time I come here, I'm still so moved." I still, and and it's it's such a part of, you know, my whole being. And and if I don't come to Normandy, on a regular basis, I, I can feel it. I can feel it in my bones that I just I need to be here. Like you know, coming to Bayeux two days ago, the first thing I did was go straight out to Omaha Beach and walk along the beach because it had been four months since I'd been in Normandy, and I was like, it's too long. I need to be here more, and and I need to just, yeah, it's it's it's. It's the place that I come to. Well, I think you know you you when you asked me last night when we were chatting as a, as a, um, what I thought of the book, and I still haven't really given you an answer. <laughs> but no, but oh no, here it comes. The thing is, is that what does make your book interesting is it is it it is in a sense timeless in that the military books are often like the ones we established are written to teach people about wars. And in fact, there are less military coming to learn about normally these days because wars have changed so hugely now. Mm-hmm. In the 50s and 60s, and we were anticipating a Russian invasion of Europe, the, the idea of tanks maneuvering in the, in the streets of, of, of cities in Europe was was yeah. what we were expecting and was yeah. what we just done. So therefore now. learning yeah. about, but that's not really what's going to happen in the future. So less and less military are learning from World War II. Yeah. But in, in, from the point of view of your book, for, for people to understand about lessons for their life. That is timeless. Yeah. So well, and, it, and something be, else... So I would place your book in a, in a, in a, in a, long, a, a long-term category, maybe where some of these books written by veterans who've long since gone away, they are very much stuck in that era they are mm-hmm. written in. Well, one of the things that um, I also... Because the, the subtitle of the book is How to Create Your Future History. And so I'm all, I think it's really important because... We're, we're living in a world today that is changing so fast. Technological revolution that we're going through and, and AI and how so many things are going to be replaced with technology and robotics. Um, and, and, and as a mom, I look at my children and I look at what, what are they learning in school and what are the skills that they're learning and what are the types of jobs that they're going to be doing in 20 years. And those jobs don't even exist today, mm, you know. And, we, mm. and, and so we can't really teach them to do something. We have to give them skills or ways and of thinking and to, adaptability yeah, yeah. and change. And, and, and so when i reading all of this... Um, 
literature today about, you know, how do we prepare for that future and what are the skills that we need, we keep looking at, you know, what are those key, unique human skills that we have that we can't, that AI will never replace? You know, it's creative thinking, it's empathy, it's imagination, it's, um, you know, response to change. And I look at all those and I say, those are all things that made D-Day a success. Those are all of the lessons that are in the book. They, they, go, they speak to those unique human qualities. And, you know, and I think, because of course, when I was writing this and I was, I was using D-Day as an example, that, this book could be written using so many different examples from history. Mm, Not yeah, just D-Day. Some, some other principle, yeah. Yeah, and, and, um, and I thought, those, those qualities that make us uniquely human are timeless. And you can find them throughout time. And so, yeah, that's what, that's, you know, again, you know, you create something and then you start to understand what it is or what you've created. But I, you know, I'm coming to realize, yeah, this is, this is timeless and, and it travels through time. You know, our ability to create, our ability to think and pose questions in a way that then opens our minds to hear answers and to understand and find connections to things that, that is, is always important. Well, the people overcoming adversity is the, is the ongoing theme, isn't it? In that um, when, when we talk about World War II and D-Day, and so many times Eisenhower, for example, said the winning factors were the landing craft, the jerry can, the, the ability to bring fuel across. And that's all very fantastic. And the, the sinews and the, the logistics is amazing. But someone had to design the landing craft, someone had to invent the jerry can, someone had to put those things, someone had to, that's the, yeah, the people plus, are the, the, the essence. And uh, we're yeah. on, you know, the, 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 the thing I wanted to bring up next was really this, the idea we're on the, we're on the cusp of a change. You know, we, are, we are a few weeks short of the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And people said the 70th will be the last time we're gonna see veterans here in numbers. And there'll be some here this year. Yeah. But this, by the time the 80th comes around, mm -hmm. So this time we can pretty much say this is the last time the veterans will be here. Um, so that it, it'll be the next gen the next anniversary will be about the, the next generations, your 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 kids who are yeah. eighteen and younger and that's the next who what are they gonna are they gonna we get asked all the time, uh, will people are still people coming to the beaches, will they will they keep on coming? Well, we don't know. We don't really know. We, no one can really predict what's going to happen in 20 years' time. Will the museums be more popular, less popular, more people coming in? Mm. Less, we don't know. It'll be how the, the, the next generation um, relates to, relate it. to it. And, well, um, and as anything, I mean, with any children, any parent knows that the way, you know, you have to, if you want them to learn something or you want them to get involved in it, you have to tell them what it matters to them in their lives. You know, yes. what difference does it make? And, th and that's, again, it's, you know, well, you're facing your, what is your current version of impossible right now? What is the thing? Well, you know, I would, I would really like to go study art. And, you know, my father wants me to go study engineering and I don't want to. And how do I face that situation? How do I approach that question with him? Or, you know, um, I would like to go travel, you know, to go to camp, you know, all summer, but I don't have the money. So how am I going to earn the money to do that? You know, we, we face these issues every day in, in one way or another. And it's, it's really, for me, it's these lessons are, it's, it's almost the, it's, it's the creative process of how do you identify something and then go about making it happen. And when I first started writing about the book and I was like, oh, I'm writing about creativity in D-Day. <laughs> and people would just look at me cross-eyed and go, what? And I feel like, yeah. Hmm. Okay. How is that going to work? <laughs> well, it's no, it, it's no more bizarre than the absolute specialist books you get about one tiny, tiny geeky aspect of D-Day. You get yeah. breakdowns of every different manufacturer <laughs> of 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 Lanning. I've got a book around there that is the codes stamped onto British weapons and where each factory was mm -hmm. and what code it had and. I mean, it's not a book you sit and read. Oh, that's the, not exactly a page turner, <laughs> but it's someone. So there's always a market for some aspect of it, and this this is a this is a, a, a universally um, interesting aspect because it's it's. I, I think you, you kind of are aiming at, at the next generation more than 
the part of it. You're not really expecting an 89 year old World War II veteran to necessarily get anything out of your book. But more than uh, maybe, well, maybe I, who knows? I would beg you know, to differ not. because I've had a lot of friends and, and veterans who have read the book or parent friends who have taken it to their parents and they said it was an amazing conversation starter. That their parents who had lived through the war or and had never spoken about it read the book and then wanted to talk about what they had done and open up to their family in a way okay, that they yeah. never had. You know, even even a friend whose mother is suffering from Alzheimer's and never reads books, she picked it up and sat with it for over an hour and looked at the pictures and then started remembering stories about her childhood and she was in the United States during the war, but what had happened and and my friend was so grateful and I thought that's amazing and I'm I'm so touched that that, that helps facilitate the opening of those conversations and sharing, you know, more because I think we 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 all benefit from that. Well, how yeah, how, starting a dialogue with veterans is always, um, or anybody who wants to is is that always that tricky bit. Like in a, a, my you know, background as a tour guide, the first few minutes of the day are always the the more most awkward really because right. you're feeling each other out and you don't just leap in and start talking about death. So you kind of have to build up and mm -hmm. say where are you from and. You just didn't do that, and what's your what's your interest, and mm -hmm. then it all then it all starts flowing. Uh, so yeah, that 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 uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, for the for the future, what's the is there an, a, a part two? Is there another? I mean, obviously you want to do the lecturing and the, and the communicating, but mm -hmm. what's the next the next uh, the next project? Chapter? Um, so I have a lot of people asking me, you know, oh, you can write ten lessons about Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> Because, you know, I spent a lot of time in that area um, of the war as well. But actually, I think my next book is going to be um, more, more related to my cultural anthropology interests. Okay. And looking at um, what differences or what changes in us when we leave our country of origin and go live somewhere okay. else and the perspectives that we gain and how that journey of self-discovery when you walk away when you step outside your country of origin so it'll be it'll be something much more autobiographical mm -hmm. i mean you know i have part of my story in this in this book as well but this one will be based more in that but i haven't even allowed myself to um to really start developing it because I'm right now. I'm I'm finishing the French translation of this book, and of course, you know, the 75th is coming up. So there's all types of activities, and as desperate as I am, and I really want to start the next project, I I'm like I have I spent too much time on this one to just let it sit. I have to help get it out there in the world but and to continue with, with the, your friends who said about doing a Battle of the Bulge book. One of the things that immediately came to my head then is. It, it, it easily definitely worked because D-Day is about us taking the initiative. It was our plan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We planned it. We did it. Here and it, and it we were more or less of. went to the way we planned it. The Battle of the Bulge, of course, is reactive, isn't it? That's about. I'm putting an idea into your book. That's where <laughs> we think the war is yeah. going this way, and, and Hitler it, and Germany throw a complete wrench sure. into the works and go, "No, we're going to try and get Antwerp." And so our reaction was all about now stemming a, a tide so it would be in the, to carry on the sort of the hmm. using the self-help idea it'd be a okay now you've 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 accomplished thing you wanted to do but now <laughs> you've been thrown this complete what appears to be a disaster in your life yeah. get on with it deal with it so it yeah. could it could yeah, that's true. it could make a good second volume <laughs> here's how to control your life and now here's how to steer, keep the ship afloat when when yeah. um you know your, your life's hit an iceberg yeah. so there there is a there, there i think is. there is a second part there, there. is but I have to say um, that this, you know, this isn't about controlling our lives. And the last lesson in the book is about, you know, freedom is not controlling the content of your life. Freedom is controlling the context. Mm -hmm. Because how could I possibly look at these veterans and the, the experiences that they had and say that they had control over it? You know, um, and, 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 you know, they were, they were thrust into this situation. They weren't the ones, they weren't the decision makers declaring war on each other, these countries. 
And, and yes, some of them volunteered to join the war, but many others were drafted. It wasn't necessarily their choice that they wanted to find themselves, you know, in a French field fighting mm, mm. with the French resistance and, and, you know, waiting for the allies to land. And, and, and so, you know, I, I want to talk about what I, would, what I realized by the end of writing this book is that we all have this freedom within ourselves to choose our response in life. And whatever comes our way, we can pause and we can choose how we respond. And, um, and so for me, that freedom that, that, you know, I always felt so guilty um, with going to battlefields or going to, you know, spending time with these veterans or going to the cemeteries. And I thought, how can I, how can I repay that debt? Do I have to go fight in a war to somehow feel like I merit yeah, yeah. what mm. I've been given, this gift of freedom that I've been given? And I realized, and the whole stories are in the books, so you can read about them, but, you know, I realized, no, the way that I can repay that is by living my life today and by pursuing the things that are most important Taking to me. Taking their lessons, but as you said, you can pause and stop and consider, which they had absolutely no opportunity to in any way, pause and self-evaluate during the war. But they did. And well, that's, that's my argument there. Okay. Like, you don't have time. And, and you do have time. I mean, you know, the British were kicked off of the continent. And then it's kind of like, well, what are we going to do? And how are we going to get back? And, and what are, how, are, how is our response, you know, how are we going to respond to the situation? And yes, a lot of times, I mean, you don't, you don't have a long pause but there are, you do have questions, mm. you, do have, you do have choices. I mean, it's, it, the quote from Viktor Frankl, who survived you know, four concentration camps, and he writes in A Man's Search for Meaning, is, is, it is basically that. We all hold this innate freedom within us to choose, to pause and choose how we are going to respond to a situation. And, um, I, you know, I, so... What I, I guess I come to in the end is I realize, you know, we have that freedom to choose in our lives. We have a freedom to decide what we're doing today and the choices we're making that, that will become part of our history mm. and that we all have that sense of agency. So going back to that beginning when I was young and I didn't think that I had, that history had anything to do with my life, actually everything I do is creating the history of my life that I will be looking back on later everything I do today yeah, and the choices I make. And, and, and what I really wanted to get across was that sense that for every individual, we have a part to play. And it's not, you know, life doesn't happen out here on this big screen and, and we just kind of watch and see. And, but we, we also get to choose. We do. Well, perhaps we'll do another interview after the anniversary because <laughs> I think we haven't in any way... Um, finish what we could be talking about but we will halt it there now thank you very much for appearing on uh the the, the channel and um wonderful thank you very much erin thank you paul <laughs>